Okay, let's make a start just to um, thank the people that were here on time and not keep them waiting any longer. Um, so it's it's great to have everyone here this morning and thanks for uh, joining. Uh, this is the first in a series of, shall we say, five uh, seminars as part of the, the monthly Quake Core series where we're gonna be introducing uh, the five different disciplinary themes uh, that are part of the Quake Core Phase 2 program. Uh, in addition to the five disciplinary themes, there are um, interdisciplinary programs. They'll get their time in the spotlight as part of the plenary sessions at the annual meeting. So this was intended to be the alternative mechanism by which people can find out uh, more information about each of these themes. Um, and so uh, I'm going to start with a few uh, sentiments. Uh, about disciplinary theme one as a whole. Um, and then um, Tim and Rolly will also um, add some of their sentiments pertaining to the specific parts of the uh, DT1 program that they're leading. Uh, so as I was just sort of alluding to uh, within the Quake Core 2 proposal, there's really these two primary parts of the research structure on the left-hand side, the disciplinary themes, uh, and there's five of those, as I mentioned, and today we're going to be talking about DT1 up there in the top left-hand corner, uh, and then there's these four additional interdisciplinary programs, and as the name suggests, they're intended to build on the expertise that exist within each of the five different uh, disciplinary themes and address uh, problems that are particularly unique uh, in a New Zealand context or that uh, either uh, are unique or require uh, specific considerations in, in the New Zealand sense. Uh, so a few uh, summary sentiments, as I mentioned, really what is uh, disciplinary theme one all about? And it's kind of encompassed in a sort of cartoon form uh, in this diagram here. Uh, so if I just explain a few of um, the points associated with this diagram, um, it starts with consideration of rupture on earthquakes, uh, and then the consequent um, immediate effects associated with those surface rupture at the ground surface on the far left hand side, uh, and then earthquake induced ground motions that obviously propagate over a wide region near the earthquake source. Uh, those ground motions or the surface rupture uh, lead to deformation in sedimentary soils or other unconsolidated sediments. Uh, that impose large demands on either the ground itself in the near surface, leading to phenomena such as liquefaction, uh, or directly onto structures uh, where we want to understand uh, how the ground motion and the near surface effects uh, result in demands on structural systems. And of course, in uh, topographic terrain, we also have potential instability of slopes, whether they be native slopes or uh, anthropogenically modified slopes as well. Uh, so really that defines sort of the phenomena. You can think of it as from the time that an earthquake occurs all the way through uh, to the point that it reaches the underside of any built infrastructure, buildings or uh, other transportation infrastructure and the like. Uh, in the red uh, colors, you can see kind of a, a key notion uh, within DT1, which is about uh, important data sets. Uh, so we have uh, techniques such as monitoring uh, that are particularly useful in problems like slope stability. Uh, we also have um, seismic instruments that can record ground motions in the subsurface, which is particularly important for understanding uh, the effect of near surface soils on site response. Uh, as well as um, ground uh, properties such as pore water pressure. Uh, and then of course we have observations at the ground surface, conventional strong motion instruments, uh, and potentially linking to other disciplinary themes by understanding the uh, observations of building response as well. Uh, so all of these different forms of data sets um, go collectively into heterogeneous databases uh, that's shown in the upper right hand corner. And those observational uh, based databases can be of course supplemented by uh, understanding um, the constitutive behavior of the natural environment through either laboratory experiments or field experiments. Uh, and then in the bottom right hand portion uh, of the image, you can really see the sort of integrated three way interplay between some of the key themes uh, within DT1, which is using these laboratory and field observations to either develop data-driven models and or integrated physics-based models. Uh, and then clearly those two different sort of modeling paradigms can uh, work together uh, and proceed um, incrementally towards improving our ability to predict things. Uh, in that regard, our overall research question is to understand the salient physics and mechanics that govern these geohazards and how we can advance prediction accuracy and precision through this integration of observational, empirical and physics-based data sets, methods and associated tools. And I think really that the, the two-part 
uh, portion of that research question is important. So the first one is really understanding the phenomena, but then importantly, using that improved understanding to actually advance our predictive capabilities. So it's not purely just a, a science question, it's also from an engineering perspective as well. Uh, in that context, uh, for those people that are not uh, familiar with uh, Quake Core from its phase one program, uh, all of the um, different disciplinary themes or interdisciplinary programs are open uh, communities. So we've, um, as I'll show on the next slide, we've had some initial monthly meeting discussions. Uh, but for those of you that are interested that are listening today, either live or we'll subsequently look at this video. Uh, if you haven't been part of uh, these discussions to date, please feel free to join them uh, by contacting either myself Rolly or Tim, uh, or having a look at these um, hyperlinks that you can see here for these wiki pages. Uh, so the sort of arc of history for disciplinary theme one is to provide a continuity uh, of some of the activities that were occurring within the Quake Call Phase One program. Uh, specifically, there were two flagships in the Phase One program: flagship one on ground motion simulation and validation, and flagship two on liquefaction impacts on land and infrastructure. Uh, in addition to providing a, a pathway of continuity for those two flagships. Uh, as we'll see, there's the addition of other geohazards, specifically fault rupture, landslides, and the consequent effects they have on the environment, and importantly, an integrated treatment of all of these three uh, different sources. Uh, so as I mentioned, we had uh, our first monthly meeting uh, last Thursday. Um, and so this is just a, a few snapshots to paint the picture of the wiki page that we have, as well as the nature of the agendas for each of these different meetings. So they're sort of open group discussions. Uh, we invite um, presentations from people that are keen to uh, talk about the work that they're doing. And in particular, as I mentioned before, these are intended to be open meetings and also to bring really the community together and talk about research in the space, irrespective of whether Quake Core as, a, as an entity is actually providing dedicated funding to that effort or whether it's an aligned program that some other uh, public or private based research funding is, is providing support for. Uh, so in that regard, we'll now sort of transition over to just providing an overview of each of the, the four main strands or pieces of the disciplinary theme one program. Uh, the first one of these is associated with ground motion uh, simulation, which is the portion that um, I'm leading. So I'll uh, talk over the next three slides about some of the key objectives that we're uh, trying to pursue over the next three and a half years in this regard. Uh, so this slide really is about uh, continuing to demonstrate and iteratively improving our ability to predict ground motions using these simulation methods. Uh, so on the left hand side, what this is illustrating is a multitude of historical earthquakes recorded in New Zealand, each one of the red uh, beach balls is the location of an earthquake, and then the blue triangles are locations where strong motion or weak motion instruments are that have recorded ground shaking uh, from these events and the black lines indicate the sort of um, the union of the fact that an earthquake occurred and it was recorded at these particular locations. So maybe not surprisingly, the the largest number of events and associated recordings happen in our high seismic regions, which over the last uh, decade in particular, but sort of two decades since we've had reliable instrument mix networks uh, have been in the Canterbury and Kaikoura regions and as well as the lower uh, and eastern portions of the North Island as well. Uh, for each one of these historical events, we're able to compare the observed ground motions as well as the uh, simulated versions of these ground motions. Uh, and as shown in the um, sort of inset figure uh, to the left hand panel, we're looking uh, at features of these ground motions, such as maximum amplitudes like peak ground acceleration and properties such as duration uh, indicated there by the significant duration, the length in a horizontal context. Uh, by iteratively comparing these uh, simulations with observations, we're able to identify uh, for a large number of events and stations the sort of systematic departures that these simulations have from observations that allows us to iteratively improve the underpinning models that are used to develop them. Uh, so up in the top right hand image uh, that's highlighting the different sedimentary basins that are represented in current versions of these simulations throughout New Zealand. Uh, at the start of the Quake Core 1 program, initially we only had the Canterbury Basin that you can see highlighted there, and then progressively over time, uh, as we've collected additional field data and also made use of other simplified metrics, uh, we've been able to build out the total number of sedimentary basins that we're able to consider. Um, as we uh, include such models within 
the ground motion simulations, we're able to compare the predictive capability and then iteratively improve them in order to um, achieve better uh, reconciliation with these observations. And so shown there in the bottom right hand side are some of the key uh, field or um, observational based techniques that we're using, which involve on the left hand side, invasive methods where we put uh, some form of device directly into the ground. Uh, in this particular case, shown on the bottom um, left hand image is measuring shear wave velocities using um, some instrumentation developed specifically by Quake Core researchers in collaboration with US partners. Uh, and then on the bottom right hand side is uh, what we often refer to as passive uh, measurement where we uh, simply bury a, a very sensitive seismometer at the ground surface and allow it to just record ambient noise in the background uh, that we can also use to understand the properties of, of the near surface soils. Uh, once we build our predictive capability, we um, are obviously um, able to focus on the problem at hand, which is predict predicting future events. Um, these are two illustrations um, that will be very familiar to you in terms of the faults that they're representing uh, in the upper left, the Alpine fault, in the bottom right, uh, an interface earthquake on the Hikarangi subduction zone. Uh, and so these are obviously calculations that we have performed, uh, but as we continue to advance the underlying theory and methods of our ground motion simulation, we're able to, shall we say, turn the handle again and keep iteratively producing updates to these calculations uh, that in particular improve our refinement of local side effects uh, and local wave propagation effects as well. And really one of the key um, aims in performing these simulations is to provide simulated ground motions that can initially supplement the existing globally recorded ground motion databases that we have. Uh, for example, for magnitude eight earthquakes, uh, at about 100 kilometers from the earthquake source in deep sedimentary basins, there really are no good global ground motions in the uh, databases that can represent that type of condition, which is particularly important for Alpine fault events in Christchurch. And similarly, magnitude nine earthquakes located at distances of 25 to 30 kilometers, there are no good observations in global ground motion databases because in most cases, uh, such subduction trenches are actually located more than that 30 kilometer distance from the coast. So again, there's some unique uh, aspects to the tectonic environment in New Zealand, and we're really performing these simulations can uh, provide us with insights that we simply can't learn by extrapolation of global trends elsewhere. Uh, when we start to consider uh, many events like this, we can also, of course, convolve uh, the simulations of those different events with the likelihood uh, of those events actually occurring or our, our predicted likelihood of those events occurring. Uh, and so what we're looking at here on the left-hand side uh, is probabilistic seismic hazard maps that are developed using these simulations. Uh, so again, this was one of the sort of key outputs from the Quake Core 1 program. Uh, and now that the computational workflow to allow these approaches uh, to be undertaken as established, really the aim is to advance the accuracy and precision of those calculations. At this point, I would call uh, figures such as shown on the left-hand side here more demonstrational than ready for immediate use. And so really one of the main aims over the next three and a half years will be um, putting the finishing touches on the methodology and its implementation in order to make them truly ready for prime time in that regard. Uh, and part of that is not just producing maps of simple intensity measures like peak ground velocity or response spectra, uh, but also demonstrating the use of these simulations for the seismic design and assessment of structures, uh, working closely with our industry partners. And so on the right hand side, you can see some illustrations of applying that to actual structures in the, the Christchurch or Wellington regions uh, where we're comparing observed and simulated ground motions and trying to understand um, the implications of using these simulated ground motions in a practical context. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to Rolly. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, Rolly Orenza here from University of Oakland. And in the next four slides, I would like to talk about the uh, projects associated with the soil liquefaction strand in uh, disciplinary team number one. As uh, Brandon mentioned a while ago, uh, in, in, uh, we, for, for the solid liquefaction aspects, we're basically continuing with some of the works that we have done in uh, flagship project number two about solid liquefaction impacts on uh, infrastructure. So we'll still continue to, to make use of our experience or our observations from the Canterbury earthquake sequence and the Kaikoura earthquakes in order to develop uh, new approaches, uh, improve the methodologies, to assess and quantify the impact of uh, soil liquefaction on uh, land uh, infrastructure. So we intend to still continue uh, implementing new technologies, coming up with databases 
for field testing, soil sampling, laboratory testing, and uh, dynamic analysis in order to address problematic uh, soils in New Zealand. Uh, there are a lot of uh, materials here in New Zealand which do not really follow the behavior of uh, normal sands where empirical methods have been uh, developed. This would involve, involve the pumiceous deposits in the central part of North Island, some silty soils, for example, in, in Christchurch, and the uh, gravelly soils, for example, from reclaimed areas in Wellington. And then we hope to more or less uh, continue the work in as, uh, improving the assessment of uh, uh, liquefaction in terms of liquefaction triggering, what would be the consequent damage associated with, with, with liquefaction, what would be the effect of these uh, liquefaction on the built environment, and possibly address issues related to mitigating or at least uh, inhibiting the impact of soil liquefaction to the uh, structure. Uh, co combining all of this, we would like to approach the uh, problems associated with liquefaction in terms of a system approach where we can combine uh, different aspects of geotechnical engineering and geology, geotechnical engineering and structural engineering, uh, looking at some of the urban systems and lifelines to come up with an integrated approach, uh, generally from the uh, micro and macro systems. Uh, next slide, Brendan. So one of the things that we would like to focus on is uh, still a continuation of flagship project number two. This is about historical evidence of uh, liquefaction in New Zealand. So uh, based on the, the works that have been done in flagship project number one, we have identified some areas where liquefaction, or at least observations or manifestations of liquefaction have been recorded. So in this particular project, uh, we would like to compare predicted liquefaction, which is based on the uh, uh, existing or current uh, SPT or CPT based uh, liquefaction methodologies with the observations to identify areas where uh, the predictions are either uh, consistent with or inconsistent with the observation. But more importantly, we would like to identify the characteristic geological environments, the soil types, the ground conditions, that are associated with the, either the presence or absence of uh, liquefaction uh, um, manifestation. This, we, we, we hope, we would improve the, the suit of uh, liquefaction prediction tools that are available to practitioners so that liquefaction hazard can be uh, better managed. Next slide, Brendan. The next one is the characterization of the dynamic properties of New Zealand's uh, problematic soil. Uh, we have done a lot of work in the in flagship project number one, looking at the uh, reclaimed uh, gravelly materials in center port. So that uh, in that particular uh, study, we were able to make use of uh, well-documented damage observations following the 2016 uh, Kaikoura earthquake and uh, the, the investigations done using over, uh, I think, 100 CPTs and then shear wave velocity profiles in the uh, uh, center port. So this project involved both laboratory and analytical approaches and focusing on uh, liquefaction and associated damage at the port using both simplified and advanced uh, methods. We have been working too on the uh, uh, characteristics of the natural pumiceous materials in the center part of uh, North Island, typically in the top of volcanic zone. Uh, this material is characterized by the presence of crushable pumiceous soils or pumiceous sands. And because of the fact that they are crushable, they behave very differently compared to the normal sands. And our initial uh, investigation seems to indicate that indeed, the empirical methods uh, that are currently being employed to evaluate the liquefaction potential of sands would not work for pumiceous soils. In fact, it appeared that uh, the, the uh, liquefaction resistance is uh, underestimated by current uh, empirical methods. And in the process, we'll also try to look at other problematic soils in, in New Zealand. Some of the uh, materials that have been put forward are, of course, the, the Christchurch City sands, which have been already a focus of study in flagship project number one and so some of the tepra and the uh, diatomaceous uh, cells are uh, present in the uh, Rotorua region. Next slide, Brendan. And this is my last slide. Uh, what we would also like to focus on is advancement of liquefaction assessment methodologies, making use of concepts that, again, that have been developed following the uh, Kaikoura earthquake and the, the uh, Canterbury earthquake sequence 
to develop more or less a systematic engineering evaluation of uh, liquefaction hazards, at least within the context of uh, performance-based uh, assessment. And also we would like to improve tools and procedures for seismic effective uh, stress analysis. This is actually a, the, the cross-disciplinary nature of the project, uh, making use of the available quick core expertise in the uh, advanced simulation tools and also uh, trying to, to, to make use of uh, available, uh, say, ground motion uh, studies to uh, in, investigate the performance of uh, uh, structures. So here we would like to uh, basically increase our understanding on some of the research areas in Quake Core that needs to be highlighted, such as the use of, as uh, Brendan mentioned a while ago, simulated ground motions in engineering practice, try to look at or assess the performance of say existing or heritage structures some some low damage technologies, distributed infrastructures like, like uh, our ur urban uh, lifelines, and the effect of damage to the uh, to these systems on, on the uh, society. So these tools that will be developed will be more or less a principal state of the art tool that can be used, utilized in various uh, scenario studies here in uh, New Zealand. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Rolly. Tim. Yeah, good day, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Sweet. Um, yeah, thanks, Brandon and Raleigh, for those great overviews. Um, as mentioned, I'm Tim Stahl. I'm an earthquake geologist. I've been at UC for just over four years now. And I am coordinating this new strand in Quake Core 2 that we're calling surface rupture and slope stability. Now, you probably are aware we've had a few issues over the last 11 years in Canterbury with um, faults rupturing and landslides. And sometimes those are nicely packaged together like they are here. Um, this is a view along the Papatea Fault ruptured in the Kaikota earthquake and along which there's several deep-seated large volume landslides. Um, and I think it's experiences like this as well as a few tweaks to techniques over the last five to ten years um, as well as the kind of the wealth of data from these historical events that I, I actually think Canterbury and New Zealand more broadly can be um, leaders in this space. So I'm just going to emphasize three things um, in this short talk. Um, the first is empirical data on fault surf structures. Um, second is a quick chat about slope stability. And the third is simulations of earthquake geohazards. Uh, next slide, Brendan. Right, so I feel like I, I need to sell the, the first one a little bit as the new, newcomer to Quake Core 2. Um, so it might seem weird to, to start with a figure from 40 years ago from across the Pacific Ocean, but this is a, a map of buildings that were deemed to be unsafe for human occupancy after the 1971 San Fernando earthquake in California. Um, and apologies, it's a bit difficult to see. Brendan, if you just click, it'll zoom in a little bit. Each of the black dots there is a building that was deemed to be unsafe. Um, and now this, this event was you know, significant for a number of different reasons. It was the first, probably the, the first major natural disaster after the passing of the 1970 um, Disaster Relief Act in the US. But scientifically, the, the thing to note here is that there was a concentration of damage to buildings and infrastructure like pipes and, and roading around the surface rupture. And one of the, the things that stemmed from this event was the passing of the Alpus Priolo Act, which established these special study zones or earthquake fault zones around mapped active faults in which um, people are required to study specifically the hazard posed by fault surface rupture. So Brendan, if you just click, I've got a screen grab of what those actually look like. This is just from the California Geological Survey. Um, each of those yellow buffers is an area around active faults, which is these special study zones. And each of the purple polygons there are site-specific geological or geotechnical investigations aimed at characterizing fault surface rupture. Um, and so in New Zealand, uh, next slide, we've actually made some solid progress in the last 10 years in understanding how displacement or more broadly fault deformation is distributed across faults. Um, so this is some work from Colin Bloom, again, looking at the, the Papatea fault. Um, the left panel over here is the, or the, the map of the 3D surface displacements that happened in the Kaikoura earthquake from differencing pre and post earthquake 
high resolution topography. The middle panels there are showing the uh, displacement in three different components and the, the width of the deformation zone associated with that faulting. Um, and the thing to, to note here, besides the fact that the Papate is an absolute monster of a fault with you know, up to eight meters of vertical displacement, is that even though we've got this very discrete fault trace, that's kind of the juxtaposition between red and blue in the left there, this fault still distributed displacement over hundreds of meters, something like a, an average of 500 meters in this event. Um, so I think taking into account our, our uh, data from you know, the 2010 Darfield earthquake, 2016, and even historical events like 1987, um, to say something about how deformation is distributed across faults is actually quite important towards improving, say, land use planning or insurance around these, these zones. Um, next slide, Brendan. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is just to show that, you know, we've got, um, besides just solid investigations of the deformation, we also have good reports on the structural damage caused by fault rupture, um, and we can incorporate those into to models as well, or at least discuss them in some of the interdisciplinary themes. Next slide. Yeah, so I feel like I need to, to sell landslides maybe a bit less. Um, they're one of our, our deadliest and costliest hazards in New Zealand. Um, and the idea here is really to provide a forum for all the, the many currently funded programs that are operating in this space. I think that's important for a few reasons. Ultimately, you know, it's good for um, the different program leaders to be discussing what's happening in their, say, disciplinary specific um, programs, like say Chris Massey's Endeavor program, as well as with interdisciplinary programs. But also, you know, there's a lot of practitioners, academics, and students who are working in the landslide space who not, might not be aware of the activity that's happening in those funded programs. So this is just a, a quick example of one of those quote unquote unlinked, if you like, um, projects looking at submarine landsliding. This is work from Laura Nesco, who's working with uh, Josh Mountjoy at NIWA and John Kerry at GNS, just showing the vertical displacement due to uh, erosion at canyon heads in the Kaikoura Canyon, um, which you know would have implications for say, um, both tsunami hazard and where we might lay submarine cables and that kind of thing. So overall there, Landslides, big hazard, and we're looking forward to kind of just bringing people together in a common forum. Next slide. Yeah, okay, so the last thing I want to emphasize here is that um, fault ruptures cause a cascade of hazards after events. Um, and we should be able to simulate the, the physics of them quite accurately. And there's many examples that I could give here. This is just one of um, a river avulsion and consequent flooding along, again, the, the Papatea Fault this is one of my students' work. Um, so the, the lineament that you see in the middle of the screen there was not there prior to the earthquake. That's the scarp of the Papatea Fault and it caused flooding and, and impacts to arable farmland along that scarp. Um, but we could simulate other hazards that are associated with fault displacement, such as um, you know, far field coastal subsidence, and how that might impact coasts and coastal communities, um, as well as the, the interaction between fault rupture and landslides, which we know is an important consideration in, in mountainous terrain. And the last panel there is just to show that we can, we can actually do this in a forward modeling sense. So we can get an idea from these benchmark case studies, what the accuracy of the models are, and then apply these to, in this case, any, any fault river intersection in New Zealand. And so, yeah, this is just kind of emphasizing the, the interplay that Brendan was on about in terms of uh, data-driven studies and uh, physics-based studies. Um, and I think there's, there's lots of work for to do in that space. Thanks, so, Tom. Yeah, thanks. So um, each of those three uh, strands that myself, Rolly, and Tim have talked to um, represent sort of sub-disciplines within uh, disciplinary theme one as a whole. And on even numbered months, such as July, September, November, uh, we have those three groups each meeting uh, for their monthly meeting separately. Uh, but then on even numbered months, we actually get together as a complete group uh, to address the last part of 
DT1 strand 4, which is associated with integrated geohazards, uh, and hence the name of the disciplinary theme one as a whole. And so uh, what we're doing, um, obviously this is a, a new part of the program in particular, but uh, is focusing on the Wellington region. Uh, and hopefully the, the reason for considering the Wellington region is uh, somewhat obvious uh, in the sense that it really illustrates um, a single spatial region where all of these geohazards become um, important and are co-located in nature. So uh, we have surface fault rupture uh, for hazards, for example, here for the Wellington Fault. Uh, we have um, documented evidence of amplification of ground motions from uh, the wider sedimentary basin in the Wellington region. We have instability of either steep native slopes and or shallow fill deposits. Uh, and then finally, nonlinear response behavior and potential liquefaction of soft soils. So at every geographic location in the Wellington region, we have generally at least one, but sometimes even multiple uh, instances of these hazards being important. Uh, and then as well as each of these sort of um, direct hazards, we have subsequent consequences. So uh, for example, associated with either surface fault rupture and or sediment due to uh, liquefaction or other nonlinear uh, soil response, we have potential subsidence and increased flooding risk uh, for example, in the um, seaward side of the lower Hutt Valley as well. Uh, so Quakecore in the past has done research in the Wellington region. There was the Wellington Collaboratory Project, uh, which ran for two and a half years. Um, but really the aim of this uh, program is to focus purely just on the geohazards portion uh, and really apply state-of-the-art methods to understand the spatial extent of these multiple hazards, um, as well as advancing uh, prior guidance based on simplified methods. So what I'm showing here on the right-hand side of this slide uh, is from the Greater Wellington Regional Council, which is a combined earthquake hazard map. Uh, these maps are obviously great for use in public policy, but they have been developed using state of practice um, techniques, uh, which are useful uh, to give a sort of general high level description, but obviously past earthquake events have shown us the subtle but important details um, that mean that actual phenomena tend to deviate from these simplistic models. So our idea is to, by applying the, the state of the art methods that are developed within each of strands one to three of this disciplinary program, uh, to apply those in a joint sense for the Wellington region. And we also expect the output from uh, this fourth strand to provide good connectivity to some of the other parts of the Quake Core program, such as uh, work on the transportation system, which is obviously highly interconnected uh, with the geology of the Wellington region, as well as some of the efforts associated with improving the post-earthquake performance of the built environment, whether that be uh, commercial structures or residential structures as well. Uh, so this is certainly something where um, we're also interested to have uh, people who are non uh, scientists, uh, sort of earth scientists and engineers uh, participate as well. So these are these monthly meetings are happening every two months. Uh, so if you're uh, someone in that category that you'd be interested in seeing the, the outputs of this, then please let me know and I'll make sure I keep you in the loop as we make progress in this regard. Uh, so that's the end of our uh, prepared slides. So um, myself, Rolly and Tim would be happy to take any comments or questions that you might have. And thanks for your time for listening. So feel free to, um, if you want to ask a question, just um, obviously unmute yourself, but also ideally, uh, if available, uh, turn your video on as well. Easy crowd, Brendan. Yeah, very easy crowd. <laughs> Okay, we won't keep any people. Um, obviously, this uh, for those of you, uh, thanks for joining, but um, if you do know people that didn't join, uh, then this um, seminar will be available on the Quake Core YouTube channel uh, after we do the necessary sort of processing to get it there. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the first of uh, five seminars associated with each of the disciplinary themes. So um, please feel free to uh, join the other ones as well as uh, hopefully see most of you at the Quake Core Annual Meeting, uh, we will hear more from the interdisciplinary programs as well. So thanks for your time this morning and um, have a good day.